Hey church family, Phil here. I wanted to take some time and share with you an update and a teaching centered around our finances as a church family. It mattered to me as we come towards the end of the year that I come alongside of you and share what it's been like in our internal finances as a church community, as well as what God has been inviting us into in conviction and stewardship and a vision for our future. There is something profound about the way we steward our finances and resources, both in honor and worship to God, and in honor and love and respect towards one another. And so it is my desire that I'll share with you practical information, stories of what has taken place, and vision for the future, because we as a church family want to be in alignment with everything that Jesus has for us. And it is my desire today that as you watch this, you'll not only get insight in terms of what has been happening with our finances through this year, but you'll catch the vision and the heart of Jesus and our church for what radical generosity can do. I know finances can be a dangerous place for many people in, in terms of conversation or theology. It's been a point of pain or conflict. We've heard stories about different places or people or churches that have misappropriated power and finances. But I'll also tell you that there is nothing more beautiful when a church community functions in integrity and in character and in honor and in stewardship. And I believe that as you hear and listen in, you're gonna find your heart encouraged and full of life. I unashamedly wanna to talk to you about finances because they are an important part of our individual life and an important part of our community life. And we, in everything, believe obedience to Jesus is our first and highest desire. And so I long for that in your finances, in my finances, and our church's finances as well. And so come along with me as I share with you where we've been, what God has spoken to us about our convictions that we carry, and the hope of things that we're leading into in the future. One of the most uh, poignant moments in my life was when I was a youth pastor. I wanna say this was probably 2007. And I was a young man and uh, brand new into full-time ministry and I'd begin to speak and travel a little bit. And I had an opportunity to speak at a missions base. And it was this season of our lives personally where we were learning to uh, function off very little. Uh, youth pastoring is not the most uh, uh, wealthy uh, position to hold in the world. Emily and I were new in our marriage, we were new in our life and uh, finances were tight. And I remember I went and I spoke at this missions organization at the very end, uh, they gave me an honorarium and that honorarium was actually a significant blessing in my life. I remember thinking about the things that we would be able to do, some bills I would be able to pay, some maybe a, some uh, uh, how, how can help go towards a vacation. It was a, it was a really uh, significant gift. And as I was there, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me that I was supposed to give the vast majority of my honorarium to a missionary uh, that I had recently met who had moved to the United States from Nepal. He was Nepalese. And I, as, as God spoke this to me, I, I had this internal wrestling because I was very excited about the help that this would bring me personally and my family. And I wrestled back and forth. And I don't know if you've ever done this. I talked in my own mind. And, was this me? Was this my desire to be generous to somebody in need? I, it, was this the right thing? What's the wrong thing? And ultimately, I came, I came to the conclusion that I needed to be obedient and I needed to give this money away. But over the next few days, my heart began to navigate a different course. And I talked away this idea and I pushed it aside and really ultimately I just said, I, I have needs and I need to take care of me and my family. And on the very last day, I was, uh, I was drive, about to drive home from Montana to Seattle. And I had this strange thought. I should go cash that check and just be able to pay cash on the way home when I have to fill up for gas. That's something I never do. It was a weird, weird thought. So I go into the bank right before I'm about to leave and drive home. And I go and I give the, the cashier the check and they, they, they give it back to me. And they say the exact amount that I was supposed to give my new friend, which was different than the check was. I said, what did you say? At first I thought maybe they had actually uh, mis misread the check. And they said, here is your blank amount of dollars. Again, the exact amount, not of what the check was, but of what I was supposed to give my friend. I remember leaving and suddenly just conviction grew in my life. I was like, Lord, I, I've got to give this money away. 
had already said all the goodbyes. I was actually on the way uh, in my car. I was, you know, at the bank about to go to the gas station to leave. And I remember just saying, I don't even know where they live. I don't know how to find them. I just had this few interactions with them. God, I've got to leave. I've got to get back on a certain time. Like, if you want me to give this money, I need your help. I need this. I go over to the gas station to fill up my car with gas right before I'm about to leave. And out of nowhere, my friend from Nepal and his family come walking by. <laughs> just only in a story that God writes. I remember running up to him and I gave him this amount of money, which was almost all of the check. It was a not all of it, but almost all of the check. And I said, I just felt like the Lord told me to give this to you. And he initially refused. And I said, no. And I gave it. I said, I have to. I have to give this to you. And I got back in my car. And I had about an eight-hour drive home. And I don't know how quite to describe what happened. I had the most ecstatic joy in my heart I had ever experienced. Honestly, it was overwhelming to me. I've never really had an experience quite like that before. I'm just driving home, just worshiping, crying, laughing, filled with joy. It was just this radiating moment in my life. And I knew, I knew it was happening. That God was giving me this smallest of insight into what happens in his heart and what happens in heaven when we step into generosity in the here and now. I've never had that experience again, but now I know. I know what happens when I trust God with my finances. I know what happens when I enter into radical generosity. I know what happens when I live in obedience, the pleasure and the joy of my Father and of all of heaven, when we actually come alongside God in his kingdom agenda to change and transform the world. This is what God has for all of us, that we would learn not to live from our perspective, but from his, and learn how to trust him in fullness with all of our finances. I love this quote by Leslie Newbegin, who's a significant theologian, he said this, we must live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the only answer. Hear that again. We must live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the only answer. Friends, I want to invite you into this. If somebody ever stumbled into your checking account, if somebody ever saw how you steward your finances, would they be provoked to go, why? Why? That which you could lean in and go, because God gave everything to me. And now I want to live in such a way that I give everything to him. This is the dream of my heart, to build a culture of provocative generosity, where the way we live within our context and our lives and our means provokes the world to know the radical trust that we have in Jesus. And so here, I want to invite you into that, both by review by vision and conviction, and by the future that I believe God has for us. But let me start with this before I get into more details. Thank you. Honestly, thank you. As I have navigated 2020, I have been blown away by the generosity and the steadfast commitment to giving of our church family. I am so, so thankful for you. And if you've been around our church, you've heard me say this a handful of times. I don't know who gives and who doesn't. It's a conviction on my life because I want every single person who comes into our church family to know that they will be loved solely for who they are and never be because they give generously or can't or won't. You matter to God and you just deserve to be treated in that freedom. But I do get pictures of our high level giving and I can't tell you how many times I've been just like, I cannot believe, I cannot believe how our church family has given in this season. So I say thank you to your faithfulness. Thank you to your obedience to Jesus. And thank you for the extravagant gifts of love that you've made to him through your local church. I also wanna say thank you to our church council. The way we steward our finances as a church community is that I walk alongside a church council, which is five people, to help make all financial decisions in our church. We're mutually submitted to one another. We approve budgets together. And it's an incredible point of accountability, leadership, and vision. 
that, that what happens through our church council is safety, protection, and stewardship over everything that we have. And so I want to say thank you to Chris Dottel, to Tiberian, to Karen Kay, to Linda Knowles, and to Jeff Cyber, all five members of our church family who walk alongside of me in this way. They are a gift to me and they are a gift to us. And the stewardship that is on their shoulders is significant. I also want to say thank you to Aisha Shamley. Aisha is our, on our staff. She's our operations manager and she stewards all of the details of our finances and our financial giving. And she is an incredible woman and an incredible leader. And I am so thankful for her. If you've ever had the chance to interact with her, you know what a kind, loving, intelligent woman that she is. And so she is a gift to us and a gift to our stewardship. We have three values which navigate how we steward our finances. The first is integrity. We want to function in integrity. If we cannot be accountable in every way and shape, then we ultimately are not being obedient to Jesus. And I hope you understand and see that in all that we do, we function in integrity. Second is this, honor. We are a people of honor. We wanna honor one another. We wanna honor each other. You will find that it is a deep conviction of our church that we'll never enter into manipulation or coercion. We'll speak directly and honestly. And friends, I call you to give because of Jesus. I understand the, the nature of that as a pastor and as my own life connected to this. I'll never be able to disconnect myself from that reality of when I invite you to give, it has impact on my life or my, the church that I lead. But I'll tell you, we, we give because we're in love with Jesus. We give because we believe it's an obedience to the scriptures. We give because we believe it's the right thing to do as followers of Jesus. But we always do that in honor and in nothing else. And last is obedience. Our desire is that in everything we do, we bring obedience at the forefront. Jesus is worthy of our lives and he's worthy of our finances. And so I wanna give you this year in review what has our finances been like in 2020? And you're gonna find, I feel a desire to get this to you before the end of the year. So what that means is all of the numbers that I'm presenting to you are as of the end of November, 2020. So when you actually, maybe in a few months are able to see our entire year in review, there will be the month of December added to this, but I believe that these 11 months are gonna give you a deep insight into how this year has gone for us. So first, uh, what has come in? What has been the giving that has been a part of our church family as of November? So this is 11 months long. First, our total general fund giving. And what is general fund giving? It's our tithes. It's our offerings. It's, it's those things that come in uh, without any category. These are just love offerings to the church as tithes. The amount through November was $940,000. and seven cents. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. The total designated giving, that means funds that are given to a specific cause, whether they're given specifically to a missionary or to a purpose or to a, a ministry or a program. So designated given, giving was $153,035.13. The total giving through the month of November was just under $1.1 million. It's incredible. It was such a radical year of generosity in the midst of cultural crisis. I'm so, so thankful for you. But what have our expenses been like? How did that meet? Where were we at in 2020? We functioned in an $80,000 a month budget. That's how we started the year. And where did we meet? How did we spend? How did life get stewarded in the midst of that? So as of the end of November, our total church expenses were $826,522.54. And you'll see that that is significantly under how much came in produced by the end of November, a net income of $267,000.68, or $68.66. Uh, it's incredible. One of the things that happened this year is in the midst of COVID, we uh, pulled back on what we spent in terms of our in-house ministries. We leaned into more generosity, pulled back into what we were spending in terms of the way we functioned as a church. And it was an absolutely, absolutely incredible 
uh, thing to experience and to see. How, what, what, is that num- what does that money look like in more specifics? That's a big number. What do we look like in more specifics? What you're going to find is that we have basically five main categories in which spending comes. Central administration, facilities and maintenance, in-house ministries, community ministries, generosity and care, and personal costs. That's six, not five. And let me share these with you. So in central administration, and what is central administration? That's the giving we give to our denomination. That's planning center. That's advertising. That's merchant fees. That's printer costs. That's office supplies. That's kind of all this stuff that goes into the central administration of our church. This year, we spent $55,427, which is roughly 7% of our spending for the year. Facilities and maintenance, what is that? That's everything from our technology that we need in our building to our uh, maintenance, to our repairs, to our facilities, to our lawn care. I mean, everything that can be included in the midst of that. We spent $67,821, which is roughly 8% of our yearly spending. In-house ministries, that's our men's ministry, our women's ministry, our youth ministry, our children's ministry, you know, everything that we do inside our own church community to love, to serve, to disciple, to lead, everything that's included in that. We spent $100,338, roughly 12% of our yearly expenses. And then in community ministries, which is how we reach out. It's the partnerships we have. It's what we do for community care. It's what we do in reaching out to our community through different ministries and outreaches and projects and partnerships. We spent $35,756, nearly 5% of our giving. And then generosity and care. This is benevolence. This is resourcing. This is gifts. This is help. This is coming alongside people and organizations in need with the radical love and generosity of Jesus. This year we spent $149,600, nearly 18% of our income into everything that God has done in our community. It's absolutely amazing. And then last, we spent $417,578 on our personnel costs. This is the finances we have for all of our pastoral staff. And just so you know, that includes seven full-time employees, four part-time employees, and four stipend leaders. It's roughly 50% of our income, which is the boundary we desire to keep and how much we spend on pastoral staff and on leadership. But I also wanna note there that the remarkable character of the people that are on our team. Friends, uh, this is not a self-statement. This is a statement to all of the people that I pastor and lead alongside. They are committed to what they do because they're in love with Jesus, not because they are paid what they are worth. Now, I dream of the day where as a church family, every single one of our employees is paid exactly what they're worth and their kingdom value and that they are honored and loved. But I also want to tell you what a point of beauty it is to me that we have a church staff and a church community that does what it does because it's in love with Jesus and not because it's seeking financial gain. What that means is that ultimately there was finances left over. How did that get split up? We had $201,767 that we put into savings. And then we had $65,301 that were specifically dedicated towards our building fund, which I'll follow up with at the end. And there's some things to celebrate in the midst of that. $21,000 given to Smyrna Elementary. Do you remember that? When we came alongside of our school to meet the needs of our community and radical generosity, came alive in our church. This year we gave $30,000 to other local churches in need. Do you know that there are pastors who are able to maintain feeding their family and not having to walk away from their jobs because we were able to come alongside of them? It's incredible. Our COVID relief fund, guys, we paid countless bills, mortgages, uh, rents, uh, cell phones, uh, utilities. We were able to come alongside families in need in the midst of COVID and provides for so many incredible things. We were able to initiate up tutoring, which I dream so much more about. What Gary has started is one of the deep joys of my heart, and I can't wait for more and more to come. We've been able to take steps with our food pantry and what we're doing to care for families in need in the midst of the season. As I said earlier, we were able to add a significant amount to our building fund, which by the way, the total now that is in our building fund is uh, $925,000. Dollars, which is such an incredible place for us to be as we consider our next steps for our future. In the midst of all of this, there have been countless stories 
of radical generosity within our church community that had never came in through the doors of the church. We're just from life to life, people to people. And I wanna say this, in the three months that we had to respond to the pandemic, March, April, and May, were the three highest months of tithes and offerings in the history of our church. That's incredible. And finally, I just wanna say, because of this generosity, I was able to maintain all of our staff's salary throughout the entire year. One of the deepest prayers of my heart going into this pandemic was that God would simply care for our pastoral team. And because of this radical generosity, we were able to do that. This is amazing. Friends, as you look at this year in review, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I believe God has done amazing things and desires for more. And in light of this, I just want to remind you of a few of our core convictions when it comes to giving. If you go on our giving page, if you go to the square.org slash give, you're going to find details of how to give. But there you're also going to see that several years ago, we did a, a teaching series through our convictions on generosity and giving. We went through our giving liturgy. If you've never watched those, I would encourage you to go back and listen because they carry much more fullness of the convictions that are in our heart for generosity. I just want to share a snapshot, just a, a little moment of some of those convictions so that you hear what drives our heart and why we are people who call uh, you to give, to give to others, and to be a people who give to your local church. First Timothy says this, chapter six, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. Friends, we are the rich. And radical generosity is part of how we take hold to life that is truly life. And I know that there are some of you when you hear me say this, say, I don't feel rich. I understand that. But we have to recognize in the midst of the world we live, no matter our circumstances, we have gifts and benefits and privileges beyond what we could ever imagine. And this call from Paul to Timothy is now to us, that we are those who must live in this radical sense of generosity in Jesus' name. There are four guiding convictions that we carry about what it means to be stewards with our finances. This is the first one. God is our ultimate provider. Everything belongs to him, and he has invited us into an identity as faithful stewards. One of the deep desires of my heart for you as you begin to navigate your finances is to begin to take on the mindset of a steward, and this is how it changes. Stewards don't think about what they should give stewards think about what they should keep. They realize everything is about, uh, they have been entrusted, is about giving it away for the good of others. And so suddenly you begin to think about, how do I manage this? How do I live my life as a steward? Recognize everything I have from my life, to my family, to my finances, to my possessions, they're gifts from God, that I wanna be a faithful steward to Jesus. Our second conviction is this, the kingdom of this world is controlled by a spirit of greed. The kingdom of God is a place of radical generosity. As followers of Jesus, we must live in consistent and substantial generosity as acts of resistance against a culture of greed that is demanding our allegiance. Friends, this is real. This is why Jesus addressed money more than any other issue in his teachings. That's why Jesus went after the spirit of greed. Nowhere else does Jesus elevate the power and the control of something in our world that wants to demand the allegiance of our heart. This is why Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. God and mammon, this spiritual power of greed that has blown into the world. We have to be those who live in a resistance to the identity of the world. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. If our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. 
If our charities do not pinch or hamper us, I say that they are too small. There ought to be things which we would like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditures excludes them. There's just something. It's not a legalism. It's not a poverty mentality. But it is about recognizing I am a Christ follower living in resistance to the spirit of the age. Third conviction. The dream of heaven on earth is ending all suffering and creating a culture of honor which we value people over possessions. As followers of Jesus, we want to learn how to increase in generosity to meet the needs of our spiritual family and the neighborhoods around us. I love that part of our giving liturgy until every need is met. The dream of our heart that we would activate this kind of love and community and generosity to meet the needs of our church family and to meet the needs of those who are living around us. And conviction number four, Jesus invites us into a real relationship that moves forward on the basis of trust. And God is asking us to be trustworthy with our finances and possessions so he can give us the dreams of his heart for our lives. Finances and how we steward our finances are actually a point of trust between us and God. And you've heard me say this more and more and more and over and over and over again. This is a season where we have to be operating in radical trust with God. Being faithful to our finances matters because what's actually at stake is trust. And trust becomes the foundation of how so many of the other things that God wants to do in our lives takes place. And in this specifically, because I, here I am talking about generosity, but I'm specifically talking about generosity that has been given to us as a church home. I wanted to take a minute and remind you of why we carry the conviction around that. The Bible really calls us to five points of faithfulness and how we steward our finances. Two of them are warnings and three of them are invitations. The two warnings are that we need to avoid debt. And there's, there's a lot in that. That's a teaching that I'm excited to give again soon about what it really means to live in wisdom and how we handle debt. The second is that we need to live in honor towards the government that is around us by paying taxes and and an element being a representation of the kingdom of heaven by showing honor by living in that way. These are the two warnings of how our financial stewardship needs to affect us in our lives. And then we have three central invitations. First, that we would be committed to giving to God as an act of worship, what we call tithing. Tithe is just simply the Hebrew word for a tenth. It's It's a picture of an act of gift given in worship to God that we see in scripture was given through the local community of believers. Second is caring for the poor and the marginalized. And third is funding the movement of the gospel. And friends, I want to tell you is that as you move into 2020, I call you, I call you as a friend, I call you as a pastor, I call you somebody who wants the best for your life and the best for what God has for all of us that these three things would store up inside of you, that you would catch a vision for giving as an act of worship, that you would catch a vision for finances transforming the lives of the poor and the marginalized, and that you would catch a vision for funding the movement of gospel movements around the world. I believe it deeply matters. Listen to Matthew 25, verse 34. Listen to what Jesus says. This is Jesus' teaching. He says, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. He's talking about a vision of us coming into the eternal age. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Isn't it interesting that as Jesus is casting a vision of this moment, he talks about the identity of those who really knew him or those who caught a radical vision of generosity to those in need. What Jesus isn't saying here is some kind of works-based salvation. He's also not trying to dismiss everything else the New Testament teaches. But he is saying something really important. Those who really knew him caught his vision, passion, and love for those who were hurting. Friends, I'm just here to tell you, 
as a pastor who loves you, you will see Jesus face to face one day. One day in the life to come, you will have an encounter with him. And I just remind you that he gave us a warning that those who really carried his heart counted the cost of stewarding their finances differently, that they loved and ministered to those in great pain. We have to be a people of this kind of radical generosity. And then we have this heart of seeing the gospel flourish around the world. One of the greatest joys of my heart, that Emily and I in our own personal finances support missionaries, that we as a church out of some of our finances support missionaries. I wanna invite you, what would it look like for you to catch a vision of saying, how can I let my finances support the flourishing of the gospel around the entire world? And last, tithing. What do we really believe about this idea, about tithing, about giving towards your local church? And again, I just wanna honor that so many people have felt hurt or manipulated, coerced into these concepts, and that I, as I come to you with them, come involved with them. But I deeply believe I'm speaking to you at a point of integrity. I want you to be faithful to Jesus. I'm not concerned. I'm not concerned for my love. I'm not concerned for my salary. I'm not concerned for my good. I have fully entrusted those things to Jesus. And what I want to call you to is a vision of faithfulness because I believe it matters in our lives. I believe that Jesus has set us free from the law, but he has called us to radical generosity. 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14 says this, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share what is offered at the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. There's a lot in this passage and if I had more time, I would share everything that this passage is saying. But one of the truths that I want to remind you of is this is we are called to give to our local church because it is right that those who love and lead a local church, if able, receive their financial compensation through it. That is a biblical idea. That is not a cultural idea. That is a dream in the heart of Jesus for his church family. It's not possible for every church family, but where it is, this is something that is good and true. Paul later says in 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 16, verse one, he says this, now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I have told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money, keeping it with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will be half to made. Here, Paul making a specific invitation to the Corinthian people, but casting a vision of how we steward our finances, that we are called to give in a thoughtful and regular way. Paul had a lot to say about money with the Corinthian church. There's a lot of connections that we could find. In his next letter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this is what he says. He goes, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that at all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Again, so many things that I would love to share with you about this passage. It's a beautiful passage, but let me be, remind you of this. We are called to give out of sincerity and joy, not out of compulsion or manipulation. I love this quote by Matt Chandler. He says this, the clearest we get in the commands of the New Testament is that every believer is called to give generously, give cheerfully, give sacrificially, give spontaneously, give regularly, give secretly, and give thankfully. We're called to give, and we're called to be a people of generosity. So let me read, I, a while ago I wrote this conviction that we carry around tithing and giving. Let me just read this to you as a simple statement of how we believe this. Believers are set free from the law, period. All of the blessing and curses have found their way in Jesus, and now grace is the atmosphere of the kingdom of God. But the New Testament does call us to radical generosity, free from a free heart that should surpass a tithe, not be less than it. Throughout the pattern of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see that believers are called to respond to God in committed love offering to him given through the gathering of God's people. 
God in his pre-law, mid-law, and post-law wisdom found that a tenth or a tithe to be a healthy example of what minimum generosity should be like. Therefore, for us, we see the invitation of the tithe to be like training wheels of generosity. It is a baseline that we hear the heartbeat of generosity within and we make it our aim. We would encourage all believers to practice radical generosity and commit to a tithe, not because they are trying to fulfill a law that Jesus has already fulfilled, but because we see this as a biblical example of how to respond to the radical love of Jesus. We believe that ultimately, when we come into this place of tithe, what we're actually doing is we're saying, Jesus, I trust you with my finances. Uh, This is an act of worship to you where I'm putting my finances, my jobs, and my securities, all my pain, all my fears, I'm putting it in your hands and I trust your leadership in my life. This is why I, I want this so much for you. It's not for my gain or our gain. Honestly, I want this for you. I know what has happened in my life when I have God. God, I give you, I trust you with my finances. And the crippling fear that comes at times that I want to control and I want to grab and I want to care for myself and the darkness that comes in my heart and then in freedom, God meets me and I go, no, God, I trust you. I trust you. And every month as I tithe, it's a reminder, God, I trust you. I don't trust my economy. I trust you. I don't trust my gifts. I trust you. I don't trust my control. I trust you. And as God has walked that trust out with me, radical things have happened. Do not go into 2021 with you being the ultimate authority of your finances. I invite you to live in radical trust with Jesus. And this is the spirit that we carry to be a people of conviction and to be a people of generosity. So what does this mean for our next season? What does it mean practically for 2021? What does it mean for the vision that's in our heart? You're going to hear me talk more about this, but there is a sense of what God is speaking to us about this next year, centered around this idea of restore and reclaim. Let me read this little part of Psalm 51, and I'm coming to an end. Psalm 51 says in verse 10 through 12, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast from me your presence, nor take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me that line, return to me, O God, the joy of my salvation, to reclaim my real identity, who I've been called to be, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to stand in your gospel, to stand in your love, to stand in your heart, that this year we wanna fully reclaim everything it means to follow Jesus in the midst of a hurting, broken world. And so 2021 is where we dream of doing that. And of course, of all things, our finances are just submitted in obedience to the real vision that God has for us. And so for us, that's how we want to steward this next season, with vision, with care, with hope, with honor, and believe that we will steward our finances towards those ends. Guys, God has incredible things for our church family. And I believe that as we take those steps into radical obedience, as we take those steps into reclaiming that God has for us, things are going to open up. Dreams that are in my heart. I believe that we're right and ready and need to be taking steps into global missions. I believe that some of the things that God has started in our community, the up-tutoring, food pantry, our dreams for foster care, it's time for those to increase in significant ways. I believe that what we have started in some of these things will in time be known as the greatest forces of good in our city and will make beautiful the name of Jesus and will call as a witness to people about his hope, his love, and his glory and will transform lives. You know, practically one of the desires of my heart is that we would next year provide health insurance for our pastoral staff. At this point, as we've tried to steward our finances, it's been something we've decided not to do, but there's an urgency in my heart. There's a time for that. I'm ready to take some of these next steps forward. And so I invite you in that, to come alongside of us and give, to catch a vision of seeing what God is doing in our city through our church. 
our 2021 monthly budget, we've set at $85,000. It's pretty crazy when you think about coming out at the end of 2020 year, we've actually caught a vision of a $5,000 a month increase from last year. But I believe that as actually God is inviting us in the next steps, it's the right place for us to posture our heart. We are going to continue to be wise. We're going to continue to monitor our spending and make sure that we are living in due diligence and faithfulness and integrity and honor. But in this 2021 budget, again, in these general large six categories and with savings, seven, this is what our monthly budget looks like for the year that has been approved by the church council. Central administration at $6,000 a month. Facilities and maintenance at $5,600 a month. In-house ministries at $12,200 a month. Generosity and care at $9,600 a month. Personnel costs at $42,000 a month. And savings at $4,000 a month. And of course, all of these budgets are incredibly much more detailed as you get down. But this is the vision that we have for this next year. And our hope is that God will open a door for our next step into a building that can allow us to flourish. It's been several years since we initiated our building fund or our building campaign. I do want you to know that we have been working with a real estate agent and a, 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 a real estate developer to continue to explore all of our options. Through this year, we've actually looked at several properties that we didn't feel peace about. They were either too small, just didn't feel peace in general, uh, or knew ultimately that they were not in our price of affordability but our pursuit of our next steps has not stopped. We are open to God leading and believing that in this next season, God is gonna meet us with the right moment and the right opportunity. And we want to be wise, patient, and obedient. And the fact that we have a building fund now of $925,000 that is waiting for us opens the door to taking that next step in incredible ways. If anything develops, about an opportunity to become significant, believe me, you as a church family will immediately know about it and be invited into prayer and processing alongside of it. But it is also one of our dreams that in this next season, God will open that door. And so going into this season of life, friends, we have to reclaim all that God has for us. We have to reclaim the heartbeat of what it means to be followers of Jesus. Everything in 2020 makes you want to close down. But I'm telling you, it is we who have been called to open up and run into the mess with the love and the vibrancy of Jesus. Let me end on this quote, which is maybe my favorite quote of all time. It's by a guy named Lucian of Minnesota. He was an ancient comedian. This was quote is recorded from somewhere maybe around 170 AD. And he uh, hated Christians. In fact, he would travel and he would do these comedies and these things where he would often make fun of Christians. And this quote I'm about to share with you actually is that, is a, is a quote of him mocking Christians in one of his comedies. But I want you to listen to what he says about them as he mocks them in the midst of Roman culture. These deluded creatures, you see, have persuaded themselves that they are immortal and will live forever which explains the contempt of death and willing sacrifice that is so common among them. It was impressed on them too by their lawgiver that from the moment they are converted, they deny the gods of Greece. They worship their crucified sage. They live after his laws. They are all brothers. They take his constructions completely on faith with the result that they despise all worldly goods and they hold them in common ownership. So any adroit and scrupulous fellow who knows the world has only get among these simple souls and his fortune is quickly made for he can play with them. Friends, doesn't matter what age, doesn't matter what moment, doesn't matter what history, there's always gonna be something in the spirit of the world that wants to mock and push against those who love and follow Jesus. But I wanna tell you, I wanna get unliked where if I'm gonna get pushed on, if I'm gonna get made fun of, if I'm going to have culture look at me and go, how foolish, may it be for this. May it be for a passionate love for Jesus. May it be for a passionate belief that what he said is true. And may it be for a passionate love for others. I would say, I have a contempt for death. And I have a love for neighbor. It's what I have. I give. This year 
matters. And my prayer for you is that all of us would step into radical obedience in Jesus' name. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. As always, if you have questions, just reach out. Fill at the square.org. I'd be happy to share anything with you. It matters to me that we as a church family walk in unity, walk in integrity, walk in honor, walk in obedience, and walk in faithful stewardship. God bless you guys.